I want you to open your Bibles to Genesis, the very beginnings. Genesis chapter 12, and we're going to start reading from verse 1. Now the Lord said to Abram, go forth from your country and from your relatives and from your father's house to a land which I will show you. And I will make you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great. And so shall you be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you and the ones who curse you I will curse. And you, all the families of the earth, will be blessed. So Abram went forth as the Lord had spoken to him, and Lot went with him. Now Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. I want to speak to you this morning on, if you want to move up, you've got to move out. If you want to move up, you've got to move out. Abraham was one of the characters in the Bible that we talk about a lot. Abraham had a great relationship with God. And the thing about God, Abraham's relationship with God is that it becomes important for us because it becomes a representation as to and a model for how God wants to work with us. God's idea about life is about interaction. It's about relationship. It's about unity. It's about you and him doing life together. He doesn't, he's not interested in what you know about him. He's trying to always introduce us to an experience and an encounter with him. He wants us to know him. He wants us to get along the road of life to be able to talk and look back and sit and say, let me tell you what God did for me. Let me talk you about the challenge that I had back then. Let me tell you about what was going on in my life when God and I went through this experience. He wants you to have a whole collection of things called testimonies. Why are testimonies important? Because it talks about those encounters that you have with God that speak about and give confirmation to what you know God to be. Until you know him to be something, all you do is you know about him. He's always introducing you to an encounter. What does a truth mean in your life? When we talk about Abram, where there are a couple of titles that we use to refer to him, and one of the titles that we use is Abram is the father of faith. It's an important title because what it really does is it gives us an indication as to Abram's identity and who he became. And it becomes fundamental because when you understand who you become, it positions you to walk into God's design for your life. He became the father of many nations. He wasn't able to become the father of many nations until he became a father of faith. Who you become is going to establish and set you up for what God's design is for your life. We have to become something in order to walk into it. You produce from who you are. It's really important. Then one of the advantages to somebody like Abraham was the fact that he had a very loose relationship with the things around him. But he had a very established relationship with God. It's a healthy place to be because it put him in a place where God was able to bless him because God could trust him. He put him at a place where What constituted Abraham's identity and who he was, what formed the foundation of his security was all rooted in relationship with God. It wasn't founded in anything that he had, any possession that he called his, any encounter or any title that he may have owned. He enjoyed those things and God was able to bless him in his life. But everything that constituted the foundational aspects to who he was and the foundation to what he was all about was all rooted in his relationship with God. The moment that you came into relationship with God, you signed up for something that perhaps you didn't expect. It's something called change. Change is always the invitation that God extends to you because he loves you too much to leave you where you are. You might think your life is fine and you might think your life is comfortable, but your life can be better. You might think that you're happy and you can survive where you are. God wants you to experience fullness of life. No matter what you have and what constitutes your sense of being, whatever constitutes your reality right now, God is always inviting you to something called change because he wants you to walk into his design for your life. 
He has a design and he has a destination. And so he's calling you out of where you are so that he can take you from that place and move you and migrate you to his ultimate destination. If you want to move up, you got to move out. God loves you too much to leave you where you are. Sometimes we don't even realize the limitations and the inhibitions that come into play in our life. And sometimes the only place that we come to realize that is when we have a foil in our life, when we have something that acts as a counter reference to where we are. You thought you were really smart until you met Einstein. And then you suddenly thought, well, I'm not perhaps as smart as I thought. What happened? You ended up with a foil in life. And something said, you know what, there's more to where you are right now. You can stretch it a whole lot further. But you didn't know it until you met him. You've got to have something in your life that creates a foil in your life that says this is an invitation to something more. God creates the foil in your life. Every time you spend time with him and he talks to you, he's going to talk to you about possibilities and he's going to talk to you about opportunities. He's going to extend to you an invitation to leave home and to walk outside of the door with him and to move into possibilities with him. Why? Because he's acting as a foil and he's sitting saying, I have a perfect plan and where you are right now, no matter what it is, no matter where you are, I promise you there's better. The challenge with where we are right now is that we find ourselves in a reality that has been defined and is constituted because of some important things. God called Abraham out of his country, away from his relatives and out of his household. When you talk about country, relatives, and household, you talk about the key influences of our reality. When you talk about things like culture, when you talk about things like social influence, you talk about things like the way the people who are close to you perceive you and the deposits that they make into your life that begin to form your self-image. You talk about the family dynamic that you grow up in. It's not about what's said to you, it's about what's modeled for you. What's happening? I'm learning all the time. And as I'm growing up in life, I'm forming and I'm building something called my reality. And my reality is going to be very much informed by all of those elements. No matter where you are, the thing about it is, is that God has put on the inside of you, a whole bunch of stuff. People have got gifting. People have got potential. People are sitting with a whole lot on the inside of them, and they're sitting saying, you know what? I'm not doing anything because I don't feel as though I have the confidence to be able to step out of home. I don't feel comfortable opening the front door and going out there and doing something with everything that is put on the inside of me because I don't have the confidence to do it, so I'm stuck at home. I don't feel as though my life's been a mess. I made some bad choices. I made some bad mistakes. I've done some pretty silly things before. And so it's more comfortable for me to stay at home because if I open the front door, who I am might be exposed to the world. So I won't go anywhere. I like staying at home because when I stay at home, I can live in what I can control and what I have influence over. And perhaps it's not the best way of handling things. And perhaps it's not ultimately delivers the kind of response that I'm looking for, but at least I know it. And so I default to behaviors all the time that are not healthy and that don't contribute life to things. I deal with conflict in a destructive way. The fact that we have differences of opinion, I don't handle it well. Why? Because I was never had that modeled for me. So it's okay to become explosive and blow up about all these kind of things and create havoc. But you know what? I don't know anything else, but it's okay. I'm going to live with the front door closed. Because you might put a demand on me. The challenge with it is when we live in a world where our sense of security and our sense of identity has been defined by environment, we end up becoming root people. You know what rude people are? Rude people are people who like to close the door and close the window and they like to form their life on the inside of their house because I'm secure there. I don't have to go outside of the walls and I don't have to experience what's outside of my world. I don't have to place myself in a point of vulnerability. There is no risk proposition with me staying in the status quo. And so I live with a small life in my small house. And there is a big wide world out there with a whole bunch of stuff going on. But I never participate. 
because I'm rooted in my house. God's always lo looking and knocking on the door and inviting you to step outside of where you are and step outside of your reality. The challenge with root people is they're always looking for God to bless their reality. The challenge with it is God is always inviting them to embark on a journey into their destiny. God's saying, I can't bless you where you are because it's a toxic environment. I can't bless you where you are because your thinking is incongruent with me. I can't bless you where you are because your behaviors and what you're doing don't line up with the way that I want to see things. So what I'm doing is I'm extending an invitation to you to sit and say, take heart, take confidence, open the front door and come with me on a journey because I can lead you to a place for fullness of life. But I can't take myself into your toxic environment and try and bless you there. So we live in a place where we're always looking for God's blessing, but we're not prepared to open the front door. I'm looking for God to do something inside my house, but I've never opened the door and stepped outside. God says to Abram, he says, Abram, I want you to know something. I'm going to do something in your life. And he says, it's going to be something that's going to be incredible. But he says, I want you to know something. In order for you to experience what I have available to you, what I need you to do is this. I need for you to let go of everything that you know, and I need for you to head out on a destiny, to move into a land that you can't see, to grab a hold of promises that you can't feel, and to grab hold of a legacy that you think is impossible. Will you trust me, Abram? Will you trust me? You see, that's the crux of everything with God. Will you trust him? For us to open the front door and to take a step out of the front door, the challenge with it is we're always looking for a guarantee that tomorrow is going to look better than today. You got to give me a guarantee that what you're offering me is going to come to pass. Otherwise, I'm not taking a step out the front door. I'm going to stay at home. That's part of the problem we have with so many Christians. I'll believe it when I see it. I'll believe it when I see it. But you'll never get it. Because in order to get it, you've got to believe it and step into it and take a journey outside the front door and God will walk you into it. There are too many Christians looking for, I'll believe it when I see it. And you never get to see it. God's extending the invitation. He's inviting you to leave home, but you want to stay where you are. Because I'm content. I'm satisfied. I'm comfortable. I might not be happy. I might not be fulfilled. But you know what? At least I know where I am. The rich young ruler comes to Jesus, and the rich young ruler is somebody who's accomplished. He's somebody who's successful. He's somebody who's achieved. He's somebody who's kept the law. From a religious point of view, he's somebody who's enviable. Everybody looks at him. Why? Because he kept the law. He's somebody who's financially successful. He has lots of wealth. And he comes to Jesus. Why? Because there's still a part to him that's unfulfilled. It doesn't matter if you had everything. It doesn't matter if you kept the law. There's still a part to you that sits and says, Ah, there has to be more. Where is my destiny? What have you prepared for me? Because I've got it all, but I'm empty. And he comes to Jesus and Jesus says, I'll tell you what, sell everything that you have and follow me. What did he do? He pointed him in the direction of his destiny. Jesus' conversation with him had nothing to do with his money. It had everything to do with his security and his identity. What he was trying to point out to the rich young ruler was this. You know what? You have title, which gives you identity. You have accomplishment, which gives you identity. You have achievement, which gives you identity. Everybody in the community recognizes you as the person who's been successful. Will you let go of it and put your identity in me? You're comfortable because your sense of security comes from the fact that you have a big bank account. But I don't want your security to be in your house. I want your security to be in your relationship with me. Will you do it? 
And it says he left there saddened. Why? Because he wouldn't leave home. He had no clue what Jesus had available for him. But he was so stuck at home that he couldn't walk out the front door. Because his identity and his sense of security was so strong in his, re- in his reality. He wasn't prepared to take a risk proposition and step out with God. God knows that. God knows that the only way to get you out the front door is to give you a guarantee. So he says, that's fine. He says, I'll tell you what. He says, I will honor my word above my name. I will magnify my word above my name. What he's saying is this. I'm going to give you a guarantee better than anything you can imagine. It's not going to be a written contract. What it is, it's going to be something far superior than that. I'm going to use my name as a guarantee for the word that I'm going to give you. What he's saying in essence is this. My word you can trust because if I fail to deliver on it, I'll step down from being God. Pretty big. Pretty big. What he's saying to you is this, will you trust me? You see, the more time you spend listening to him and the more time you allow him to take his words and to put them inside of your life, something's going to start happening on the inside of you. Something's going to start to grow on the inside of you. And before you know it, you're going to find yourself at a place where you have the confidence to be able to take something that he said to you because it's so established on the inside of you and you will have the comfort and you will have the confidence to be able to open the front door and to take a step outwards. What are you doing? I'm heading in the direction of my destiny. Why? Because I spent enough time with him to know that I have the confidence to do something with him. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Faith is the substance that's going to introduce you to your destiny. And the very fact that it exists is evidence of potential in your life. If you will spend time with him, It'll grow up on the inside of you. It'll get established on the inside of you. But it happens because God wants to shift your world and God wants to shift your sense of security and your sense of identity so that it moves from what constitutes my world and my reality to something that is based on relationship with him. What he's saying is, I want your confidence based on the rock. The rock that's not going to change. And that's me. What he's saying is the journey that we go on and the journey that we're going to move through, that your confidence that you're going to have to need, that you'll need in order to get you to where we're going has to be based on relationship with me. It's never going to be on anything. God's words are important because God's words do two key things. Number one, they begin to define for you the destination that he's taking you to. The second thing that they do is it begins to highlight the journey for you. It's a lot like GPS, Waze, Google Maps. If you turn it on, it'll tell you where your destination is. And the very next thing it says is, would you like to get going? Would you like to start your journey? Would you like to open the front door? Let's go. The challenge of so many Christians is that they don't want to take a journey. They want to be translated. (laughs) I want to step out my front door into the blessing. The problem with it is that you're not equipped to handle your blessing. God's going to take you on a journey because sometime, some point between where you find yourself right now and his destination for you, he's going to do some stuff in your life. He's going to grow you up in certain ways. You're going to encounter some challenges that he's going to equip you for. You're going to move through some experiences with God and you're going to overcome those things so that you're going to get to know him. So that when you get to that point where you inherit your promises, you're capable, you're able to step into those things, grab a hold of those things, hold on to them and manage them and steward them in a way that is effective. You know what the problem is with so many people who win the $1.6 billion jackpot? No, I'll tell you. 
This is the problem with a lot of people. They've grown up in environments where they have not been effectively schooled in how to steward finances properly. You know what happens? The disposition that I have towards finances and the way that I manage money is not healthy. So it doesn't matter if you give me a dollar or a billion of it. You know what? It doesn't change my disposition towards it. It doesn't change the way that I manage it. So what ends up happening is that my stewardship is compromised and that's why you end up with so many multimillionaires bankrupt in five years. And you think, how did you squander that money? Why? Because you never took a journey. You were translated. When you take a journey with God, God equips you for your future. God equips you for where he's taking you. God equips you for your destiny. He's getting you set up so that you can step into that and that you can steward it effectively. He did it with Israel when he took them out of Egypt. He did it with Joseph. He did it with Moses. He did it with Jesus. We're not going to be any exception. He's inviting you on a journey. He wants to take you somewhere. He speaks into our lives because he wants us to build up the confidence to be able to go on that journey with him. And until we have that confidence, the problem that we have as Christians is that we're always looking for the benefit of his hand, but we don't want the influence of his person. We want the benefit of his hand, but we don't want the influence of his person. I want to know him as Savior, but I don't want to know him as Lord. You see, when you talk about him as Lord, it talks about the position that he holds in your life. When you talk about him as Savior, it's what he's done for you. People want to talk about my saving grace, but they don't want to talk about his Lordship. The Savior doesn't invite you out the door, the Lord does. We feel uncomfortable about that because we sit there and we think, well, he's going to make demands on my life. It's because where you are and what constitutes your thinking, what constitutes your disposition, what constitutes your attitude, what constitutes your, uh, your behaviors is toxic. You're sowing bad seeds in your life and he's saying, okay, come with me. He's, walked in, he's walking into the role of parent. I do it all the time. This is my practice ground. <laughs> what do I do? I see what's happening with my kids, but I understand that, you know what? I don't want you to go through life that way because I can see that that tendency is destructive. I can't change you, but I can invite you out the front door. And so what do I do? I sit and I talk to them and I sit and say, you know what? You carry on like that. Let me tell you what's going to end up happening. Let me explain to you something. When you understand and you value people, and when you have an appreciation for who they are, you'll respect boundaries. Which means that you don't have the prerogative of stepping into everybody's life and making stuff happen. That's right. So now let me tell you what you need to do. When you grow up, you know what? Respect the fact that people have the right to think that they want, say what they want, and do what they want. You're not the parent, I'll handle it. If it's your siblings. But what I want you to do is this. I'm trying to ingrain and I'm trying to put on the inside of you an appreciation and a respect for a principle of life that's going to put you in good stead down the way. Why? I'm trying, trying to change and influence thinking and make the thinking new so that it moves from a place of self-indulgence and because I have an attitude, an opinion or anything else, I feel as though I can walk in and let everybody know what I think to a place where I have reverence and respect for other people. I'm changing the thinking. And when I change the thinking, I'm trying to influence the behavior. Stop feeling at liberty to open your mouth all the time. <laughs> Sometimes it's better to shut your mouth. You can have your opinion, but don't do it. What am I doing? I'm trying to set them up to leave home and to walk into a place where they can walk into a successful future. Not a place where everybody sits and says, you know, you want to take a wide berth around that one. Because it's got a lot to say and a lot of criticism. God is working in our life all the time. The Lord is always working in your life. Lordship is saying, you know what? Let me speak to you about where you are right now. But I'm an adult, Lord. I can do what I want. You don't want to leave home. You don't want to leave home. 
Fix my relationships, Lord. Help me with this addiction, Lord. I need financial provision, Lord, but I'm not going to leave home. We want the benefits of his hand, but we don't want the influence of his person. He's saying, you know what? I'm going to set you up so that you can be successful in every aspect of your life, but you're going to have to take a journey with me. You're going to have to take a journey with me. We only encounter him as Savior when we honor him as Lord. You will only encounter him as Savior when you honor him as Lord. When you make him Lord and you allow him the right to have influence in the way that you think, so your disposition to life changes. When you allow him to be Lord so that he has influence in the way that you handle things, so that you embrace God's concept towards handling life, you position yourself for blessing and the Savior steps in. Give and it shall be given unto you. It flies in the face of everything that's inside your home. Because inside your home, it says, if anything that you want to have more of, anything that you want that's going to constitute your future, you need to hoard it. Put it into a storehouse. Keep it for future. God says, well, that's not the way the kingdom works. So the Lord begins to introduce us to his way of thinking. And then he says, are you going to be obedient to what I ask you to do? Are you going to give so it'll be given unto you? The reason so many people haven't got any friends is because they're not friendly. If you don't have friends, when was the last time you sowed a bit of friendship? What are you sowing in your life? It's a principle. Because you see, Lord is always going to introduce you to the constitution of the kingdom. Lordship will always introduce you to the constitution of the kingdom. It's called grace. Grace is not freedom to go and behave any way you want, say any silly thing you would like, and think that you covered. Grace came at Jesus' expense. And there are rules that govern grace. There are rules that cover the, cover the constitution. The role of lordship is to take the constitution and to reveal it to you so that you can take it and you can begin to apply it to your life. So you can step into grace. Because when you step into grace, the Savior steps into your situation. When we understand the constitution of the kingdom, it changes the way you walk and it changes the way you talk. It changes the way you walk because you walk into a life of a superior nature. Why? Because I'm walking out of something that's going to define my future as opposed to what characterized my past. I'm allowing the Lordship of Jesus to give definition to where I'm going. Rather than hankering over the root of where I used to be. Don't look over your shoulder. Don't look back. Keep your eyes fixed ahead of you. Where are we going? Where are we going? It may be unsettling. It may be uncomfortable because it's not your norm. Doesn't mean that it's wrong. We do it and we step into that because he's called us to that. It, it's, it's a lifestyle of faith. The faith shall live by, uh, the just shall live by faith. What is he saying? Life of a superior nature comes when you're introduced to the constitution of the kingdom. And you grab a hold of that and you make that the, the, the framework to your life. It doesn't only change the way that you walk, but it, 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 it changes the way that you talk. It changes your conversations with God. Because until you understand the constitution, until you understand grace, you always live in a place where you're begging and pleasing for God's intervention. Fix this God, fix that God, please come in and do something. Come to my house, Lord. When you understand the constitution, it changes everything. Because the constitution is an invitation to partnership. When you understand the constitution, you suddenly recognize what the will and the intention of the king is. 
And when you understand what the will and the intention of the king is, it's easy to go back and sit and say, Father, I want to thank you right now that I'm facing this challenge in this situation. I want to thank you, Father, for that Jesus paid his, the price for it so that by the stripes of Jesus, I am healed. And Father, right now, I come into agreement with you and I'm living in the expectation that the Savior is going to come and manifest himself in this situation. Why? Because all of a sudden, when you live out of grace, what it begins to do is it begins to open up opportunities for you and God to get into partnership with something. Thing. and I'm running out of time but I want to leave you with something else Genesis chapter 15 God does something very important he cuts covenant with Abram and what he says to Abram is this he says everything that I've promised you is going to come to pass everything that I've promised you is going to come to fruition and I'll tell you what the way that we're going to seal the deal is the two of us are going to enter into covenant and God goes into covenant with Abram. Two important aspects amongst a whole bunch of others that you need to know about this. The one thing is this. There are two things that happen that are very consequential when God and Abram entered into covenant. Number one, there was the sharing of blood. Why is the sharing of blood important? Because the life is in the blood. What God was saying to Abram was this. You know what? Your life and my life are going to come together. And the two of us, what we can do together is going to be incredible. Because what Abram can do by himself is nothing compared to what Abraham can do with me. The second part is not only about sharing of the blood, it's about sharing of names. What God said to him was this, I want you to take part of my name, part of Elohim. I want to take the H and I want to put it into your name. And so you're going to become Abraham. You're going to move from being the father most high to the father of many nations. But I want you, that's not the point. I'm getting to the point. The point is this. Abram didn't realize that God was doing something far more, far deeper. And he didn't realize it until later. But you know what actually he had done? He had entered into the rule of what you sow, you will reap. What did Jesus say? Unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it abides alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Jesus said, you know what? Unless I die, I can't bear much fruit. What is he doing? God was saying to Abram, you know what? Unless you prepare to die to Abram, I cannot raise Abraham. He said the same thing to Saul. He met with Saul on the road. And he said to Saul, I want to do something in your life. Are you prepared to die to Saul? Because if you're prepared to die to Saul, I'll raise up Paul. You see, when you die to Pharisee of the law, he can raise you up. As apostle of grace. What did he say to Simon? Simon met with him. And Simon's talking to him. And he said, who do men say that I am? And he said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And he said, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. And the extension that he put out there to Peter was to sit and say, do you want to get rid of Simon? Because I can introduce Peter. God is always in the process of introducing our nature to our character. You have no control over your nature. A fish swims. It's his nature. He can't change it. Doesn't matter how much he may want to, he's never going to be a kangaroo. He's never going to hop. A fish swims. A bird flies. It's his nature. You have no influence over your nature, but you do have influence over your character. When you decide that you want to just take that one, and you're not allowed to, what ends up happening? You do that over a period of time, and you'll get a reputation for being a person with sticky fingers. What happens? Because of the way I elect to behave, it influences my character. What God says is this. He's always in the process of introducing your nature, his nature to your character. When you got born again, his nature came, lived on the, lives on the inside of you. And so what he says is, it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Every time you're presented with an opportunity to make a decision about how you want to go forward in your life, every time you're presented with an opportunity to open the front door and go somewhere with God, you're going to have to make a decision. It's no longer I who live or Christ who lives in me. Because when you prepare to lay your life down, what you do is you position yourself for him to be lifted up. 
When you make a decision that you're prepared to sacrifice my thinking, my attitudes, my behavior, because I believe that what you have to offer is truth and I'm prepared to lay mine down in the interest of your nature taking preeminence, what I do is I sacrifice my life and when the seed falls into the ground and dies, you position yourself for him to do so much more through you and produce fruit in your life. He who finds his life will lose it. He who loses his life for my sake will find it. He's talking about the same thing. He's talking about the same thing. So I'm taking up the offering today. Jesus says, I've given you a new covenant based on better promises. What Jesus did was, he took something called tithing, which was a law in the old covenant, and he made it something that we can invest in the new covenant. You sow seed in the new covenant. The motivation of what you give should always be preeminent. You don't sow to get. The reason you give is because you have an appreciation and you have a value for what it is that he's done in your life. You tithe because you've come to a place where you sit and say, Father, I want to thank you that everything that I have, everything that I enjoy is as a result of the way that you've blessed me. I want to thank you for giving me the ability to use my body. I thank you I can move. I want to thank you for giving the ability to use my mind. I thank you for creativity. I thank you for innovation. I want to thank you, Father, that you are the one who's created spaces for other people to come into my world and bless me. I want to thank you that you've opened doors of prosperity to me. I want to thank you, Father, that you've given me innovation entrepreneurship to go and down certain avenues. I want to thank you that you closed some doors to me because I shouldn't have gone down there. But I want to thank you that you opened others. I want to thank you for the favor that I've got. What are you doing? You're coming to a place where you sit and say, Father, everything that I have, I so appreciate what you've done for me. And Father, as a gesture of my appreciation for you, I give this back to you. And I say, thank you for what you've done. That's a healthy way to do it. Don't do it out of law, you do it out of grace. If you can't do it out of grace, wait till you can. Just rather hold on to your money. I'm not trying to be funny, I'm serious. Because you're just putting money in for no reason. It's a spiritual exercise. It's not about the money. But you've got to get your heart right. You've got to get your heart to a place where you have that gratitude. Where I can sit and say, Father, I've died to the fact that it's all about me and my work, and my effort, and my energy, and I'm giving something of mine to you. That's grudging. Don't do it. Just rather hold on to it. Wait till you get a revelation. It's a better place to be. But when you give it, you give it with the expectation. Father, I want to thank you that this is a seed that I'm investing with you. And I want to thank you, Father, for a return on it. Live in the expectation of a return. You know what? When your heart is right with God, you can expect a return because he can trust you. He can trust you. And he knows I can afford to trust you with blessing because it's not going to consume you and become something in the way of our relationship. If ever your finances become a barrier or you give grudgingly, It's a place in our lives to take a step back and sit and say, Father, tell me what's happening in my life that this has taken preeminence. Father, I just want to thank you for incredible people. I want to thank you, Father, for the the, the amazing job that you've done, Holy Spirit, in each of our lives. I want to thank you that you're always at the door knocking, inviting us to step out of that front door and move somewhere with you. I want to thank you that you have incredible futures planned for us. I pray, Father, for people who are stuck at home. And Father, I just pray right now that, Holy Spirit, you'll just continue to speak words into their life, that you'll put on the inside of them the courage to be able to take a leap outside of that front door. I thank you, Father, for the lifestyle of faith that walks us into possibilities, that walks us into destiny, into things that we could never experience and encounter on our own. I thank you that it's a way for us to journey with you and encounter life together with you. I bless you for it now. Amen.